What an awesome video. I love that speech, and I, uh, I love the one line where he talks and says that it's not that they just gave up one life, but they gave up two lives, the lives that they were living and the lives that they could have lived. And so uh, just before we get into the normal stuff uh, here on Sunday, I just wanted to take a moment just to, uh, just to re- remember and to reflect. I mean, if you'll just join me in prayer, I just want to pray for uh, the families of those who have lost loved ones. Um, who fought to secure our our freedom. So let's just pray together for a moment. God, we're so grateful, Lord, that we live in a free country. God, as as much as we can say that our country has problems and has issues and divisions, God, we are grateful that we are here. God, we're grateful that we have the right to protest, to disagree on issues, to, to disagree on principles, God. God, we're grateful that you have allowed us to be in this country where we can truly be free. God, we know that ultimately you are our protector and our provider, God, but you have used so many men and women who have given of themselves so sacrificially, given of their their time and giving up their rights, God, and, and not just to go and to live, but to go and to die for us. God, we're grateful, and it is a debt that we could never repay. God, we pray right now for the family members um, of those who are still around, God, and and for those who have lost loved ones during this time, God, that you would give them extra peace and extra comfort during this day. God, let them know that they are loved and cared for, God, and, and let us uh, be a part of that, of loving and showing respect and reverence where it's due. God, I pray that you would just help us to remember not just today or tomorrow, uh, but we would live with a heart of gratitude and a heart of gratefulness. God, we're grateful for the men and women who died. And we remember them. And we honor them. God, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, well, good morning. My name is Eli. I'm the campus pastor here at Nickel City. Uh, today we are continuing our series, and we're actually finishing up our series called Living the Life. And in this series, we've been talking about living a life that has purpose and meaning. And we found that our lives begin to take on new purpose and meaning when we align ourselves with God's plan for us. So far, we've looked at three different areas. First one we looked at was love and how everything else needs to come out of a heart of love. The second one was serving, and we looked at what it means to have the heart of a servant and how God can do really great things through those who have a servant's heart. And then last week, we looked at giving and living a generous life. And how ultimately the things that we hold on to go to waste. But the things that we give to God make a difference. And today, we're going to be talking about going. Going. Now, when we talk about going, I think that it's important to start off asking the question of, well, why is it important to go? Why should we go? What is the reason? What is our motivation for going. I think that it has a pretty simple answer. I think it's, it's an answer that we find in the Bible, and it's because God has created us to go. If we look at what we call the Great Commission, it is some of Jesus' last words here on earth. He gives his disciples one last mission, one last charge. And so let's go ahead and, and read that together, because this applies to us today. Matthew chapter 28 says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am always with you, even to the end of the age. We go because God tells us to go. And I think this is an amazing thing that it, God in all of his wisdom and all of his magnificence and his magnificent plan to save humanity, he included us. Isn't that pretty interesting of a thought? See, he sent Jesus down to die and Jesus died and he rose again. And then phase three of this plan was for us to get involved and to tell others about Jesus. I think that's incredible that God, in all of his magnificence, chose to include us as part of his plan, and he calls us to go. 
So that's the reason why we go. We're part of God's plan. Now, as we jump into this idea of going, I want to look at a particular man in the Bible. And his name is Paul. Now, you might know about Paul. Paul is a, a pretty famous guy in the Bible. He, in fact, wrote a lot of the books in the New Testament, which is the second half of the Bible. And so uh, some of the things that, that we know about Paul, he wrote the book of Romans. And Romans, in chapter 12, he tells us that we should set ourselves apart as living sacrifices to God. We know that Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, we find the armor of God. And if you were here uh, during our series a, a few months back, we did a series called Stand and talking about how we equip ourselves with the armor of God so that we can stand against the fiery attacks of the devil. Well, Paul wrote that. He wrote about the armor of God. We see that Paul wrote the book of Galatians, which has the fruit of the Spirit in it. it. tells us that the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of God in our lives is love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul wrote the book of 1 and 2 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians, it tells us what love is. It gives us a definition. It says that love is patient, love is kind. Maybe you hear that verse when you're at a wedding does not envy, it does not boast. And it's this beautiful definition of what genuine real love is supposed to look like. Paul wrote the book of First and Second Timothy, which gives us instruction in how the church should function. And he wrote many more as well. And so as we look at the life of Paul, I think we all can agree that Paul is a pretty awesome guy, right? He's, he's a pretty awesome guy. We look at the things that he did and, and the writings that have encouraged us, and we, we can all agree that Paul was a pretty cool dude, right? He did a lot of really cool things for God. But that wasn't always the case. See, I want to take a quick review of Paul's life. See, before Paul... Before this person that we see writing all the books of the Bible and giving all this wisdom and insight and God using him to write uh, these Bible books, we see a man named Saul. And that was Paul's name before, was Saul. As we read about Saul, particularly in the book of Acts, we see that Saul was not a good guy. Saul hated Christians. Saul persecuted Christians. Christians. It was actually Saul's job to go and to kill Christians. If, if Saul were around today, we would call him a terrorist, right? He went around killing Christians with the singular goal to stop Christianity from spreading. But then something happens along the way. When Saul was going to persecute more Christians, to put more Christians to death, to, to try to stop Christianity from spreading, God meets him on a road to Damascus. And he meets him and blinds him with light. And, and Saul is terrified. Then he hears a voice and he says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul's like, I don't know who this is. Who are you? And he says, I am Jesus, the one that you persecute. So Saul's life begins to change. He goes and learns more about Jesus. He gets baptized, and he gives his life to Jesus and says, I want to start doing things for Jesus. But the disciples were skeptical. I mean, wouldn't you be, right? There's a guy who was out killing Christians, and all of a sudden now he wants to meet because his life had changed. And so they didn't want to have anything to do with him, but one disciple in particular wanted to give him a chance. His name was Barnabas. And Barnabas ultimately convinces the other disciples to give Saul a chance. The next thing that we see is that Saul and Barnabas pastor a church together. And they pastor a church for one year. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. So they're in the church. And it says, One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. 
So they were praying and they were fasting. Now, fasting is when we give up something in our life and replace it with God. So oftentimes people will do food. Maybe you'll, you'll fast a meal. And you say, you know what? Instead of eating this meal, I'm going to take time out of my day and I'm going to go spend time listening to God. Maybe you do it for an entire day. And you say, you know what? Every time I get hungry, rather than going and opening up my fridge, I'm going to go to my Bible and I'm going to listen for God's voice because I'm desperate to hear from God. You can fast other things too. You can fast entertainment and other things. But it's the idea of taking something out of our lives and replacing it with something that is of God. And so they're praying and they're fasting and they hear that they're supposed to go. Now this brings us to our, our first point, that we are supposed to go where God sends you. Go where God sends you. So they're praying and they're fasting, and as they're praying, they feel like they're supposed to go. So they pray some more, they make sure they're supposed to go, then they, they send them off. And Paul and Barnabas start off on a journey. Now here's an interesting fact. This is where we actually see Saul change his name from Saul to Paul. You know, a lot of times we like to think that it happened on that road to Damascus, that as uh, Saul's life changed, that he took on a new identity called Paul. But that's not exactly the case. See, Saul pastored a church with Barnabas for a year, and God referred to him as Saul. But something happened when he was sent. When he went, when he was going, that is when his name changed from Saul to Paul. So we'll refer to him as Paul for the rest of the time now. But there's actually an interesting uh, fact about his name change. See, Saul was a Jewish name. And Saul was a name that he was proud of. Remember, he was a, a Jewish man persecuting Christians. But as he went out to travel and to preach about Jesus, he didn't want to come as a Jew. He said, I'm coming to you as Paul. I'm not coming to you as Saul, the Jewish man who has it all together. I'm coming to you as Paul, one of you. And so that's where we see his name change. So Paul and Barnabas, they start on this journey. And they preached and they traveled and they told others that Jesus was the Savior, that Jesus was the Messiah. And as they traveled around, some pretty crazy things happened. Some of it was really good. One of the first things that we see in their first journey is they come in contact with a sorcerer, like a witch doctor. And this witch doctor looks at them and, and, and is trying to shut them up. And so they get into it, and they get into this, this spiritual battle with this witch doctor, and ultimately, God shows up and shows his power and shows that he is the real, true source of power. So we see that. We see as they preach that people were being healed, and that people were giving their lives to Jesus. We see entire cities turning away from their old idols and giving their lives to the one true God. So some great things were happening, and they were witnessing them with their own eyes. But some of their journey was bad. There were bad things that happened. They got run out of town. In fact, on Paul's first missionary journey, he almost died. They, they formed a mob, and they grabbed him, and they threw rocks at him, the Bible says, until they thought that he was dead. He was within an inch of his life, and, and they thought he was dead. They continued to throw rocks at him. Then they dragged him out of town to rot. But Paul gets up, and he goes right back into the city that just mobbed him and stoned him almost to death. See, God wasn't done with Paul yet. Even though they faced adversity, they kept going. And there were lasting results. See, when we follow God and we go where he sends us, amazing things happen. It matters. It has purpose. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's 
sacrifice, sometimes it hurts. Sometimes going where, where God sends you feels like people are throwing rocks at you. You know what I'm talking about? It's hard. It's difficult. But it's always worth it when we go where God is sending you. Here's my question for you today. Where is God sending you? What does your missionary journey look like? Who is God asking you to tell about Jesus? It might be in another country, halfway around the world. It might be halfway across the country. It might be asking you to be a missionary to Kenmore. It might be calling you downtown might be asking you to go to the Buffalo City Mission, to the Northtown Pregnancy Center. But where is God asking you to go? What does your missionary journey look like? It might be your high school or your college. You might know where God is sending you. As I'm naming these places, you might know it in your mind and say, this is where I'm called to. But it might be a place that you've never even thought of yet. But no matter where it is, when we follow God's leading, amazing things can happen. It won't always be easy, but if we follow God, it's always going to be worth it. We need to go where God sends us. Go where God sends you. The second thing that we're going to look at is that we need to go where God has you. We need to go where God has you. See, Paul went on several missionary journeys. And oftentimes, he would end up a little bit rerouted. He would end up in places that he wasn't really expecting. Oftentimes, that was prison. He would end up in prison. Another time, he was a prisoner, and he was uh, sailing on a ship, and his ship got thrown off course, and, and there was a bad storm, and he got shipwrecked on an island in Malta. But the amazing thing is that no matter where he ended up, wherever he went, Paul's mission didn't change. See, not only did Paul go where God sent him, but he was faithful wherever he was at. I wanted to look at this story of Paul and Silas. So Paul and Silas were, were preaching about Jesus, and they had just healed a, a young girl who had a demon who was uh, possessing her and, and coming against her. And watch what happens. You would think it would be a good thing, but it says a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas. And the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were singing and praising God. And the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All of the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed all the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for the lights and ran down to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into the house and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. What an awesome story, right? 
So Paul and Silas, they're in prison. They just have been beaten severely, and they are locked up in the inner dungeon. And what do we see them doing? We see them sitting there complaining, arguing, saying, you know what, this was your fault that we're in here. No, we don't see any of that. We see them praising God and worshiping. How incredible is that? You know, the, the Bible doesn't tell us why they were worshiping. Could have been for their own sake. To, to keep their focus fixed on God, even in the midst of hard situations. Or it could have also been for everyone around them. It says that the other prisoners were listening. And so they literally had a captive audience that they were just singing and praising and, and talking about God. And then as they're worshiping, something amazing happens. The, the, the foundation of the prison begins to shake. Every door pops open that everyone's chains fall off. Now remember this guard, he's terrified. He had one mission, hey, don't let them escape. So he wakes up and sees all the doors open and he's ready to kill himself. We don't know why. We don't know if it was out of fear, if he was going to get punished, or maybe his family would have, if, if they thought that he was a traitor, or if it was an honor thing that he failed his job. We don't know the reason, but he's ready to end his own life. But Paul says, no, hey, wait, we're all here. And then him and his entire family, they learn about Jesus, they get baptized, how amazing is this story? I love this too because if I can be honest, if I'm in prison being beaten, I'm in jail, God sends an earthquake and the doors pop open, I'm not sticking around, all right? I'm headed out the doors. I'm like, all right, thanks God. I'm on my way. But Paul and Silas didn't use it as an excuse to run. They went right where God had them in that moment. They preached to the jailer. You know, and this isn't the first time that we see Paul do this. We see him actually do this in, in many other instances. One of my favorite is when Paul is a, a prisoner and he's on house arrest for a few years. There's a verse in the Bible and it says that he welcomed everyone in his home and he preached to everyone who came in. Look, that was not his plan. That was not the, the mission that he had, that God had sent him to go be in prison, that God had sent him to be on house arrest. But he used the time that he had and was faithful in the midst of it. He went right where he was at. We need to do the same thing. You know, you might be sitting here and saying, well, you know, my job is just a stepping stone. I don't really love my job. I want to be gone within a year. Even more of a reason. Use it as your mission field now. Use your job as your missionary journey right now. Well, look, you know, Buffalo is, isn't really my home you know, I'm just saving. I want to just go to Florida. I'm going to move to Florida. And, and then I'll start settling down. Then I'll get involved in church. Then I'll get involved in my community. But God wants you to go where he has you right now. Whether it's for a year, whether it's for a month, God has a plan for you. See, God doesn't want you to just get by where you're at. He wants you to thrive in your mission field that he's given you. He wants you to go right where you're at right now. It might be your school. It might be your family. It might be your in-laws. Well, they aren't really my family. Go. Not just where God sends us, but to where God has us in this moment. As we get ready to close here, I wanted to share one more story. Because we should go. We should go where God sends us. We should go right where God has us. 
But the places that we go should also look different after we've been there. Many of you know that I have two kids. We have another one on the way, so we're getting excited for that. We have two kids. Clara is almost two years old, and Emery is about 10 months at this point. And they're great kids. We love them. Well, one day we were uh, leaving church, and someone in the church gave us uh, some homemade chocolate. I'm thrilled. I'm a sweet tooth, so I was really excited to have some chocolate. We ate some in the car, and it was delicious. We loved it. Random fact, my daughter Clara, up until like a few months ago, didn't even like chocolate. She liked all other kinds of sweets, but she would spit out chocolate and just be like, no thanks. But now she's at a point where she actually enjoys eating chocolate and, and loves eating chocolate. So when we got home, we put up the chocolate onto our counter. Well, the next day, I, I left the house, and Deanna was getting ready. Uh, she went into the bathroom to take a shower, and when she came out, she realized...